Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, episode 19, with myself Ryan, we've got Sam, and we got Jackson. Um, so this week we're going to be brought up to speed by Sam with industry news, and um, everything that's been going on in the world for film this week, um, and then we, we thought we'd do something a little bit different. Um, so we wanted to showcase a little bit more in terms of who we are here at Trash Arts. Um, so without further ado, Sam, industry. So I believe we may have discussed it before, but there is plans to do a new Planet of the Apes trilogy with the director Wes Ball and pretty much exactly the same creative team. He even said like we're getting the same crew in, we're getting the same, some of the same cast, but it's in a different direction. So I don't know, why not just call it the fourth film? Why, why say it's like a reboot, but it's not a reboot because everybody liked it recently, so let's not reboot it completely. I don't know, we'll see what new angle that goes with. Another bit of pointless sequel news, we have uh, Labyrinth 2, oh. which yeah, which was the Jim Henson film from the 80s with Bowie and uh, Jennifer Connelly. Mm. It was originally going to be made a couple of years ago with the guy who did Evil Dead remake and um, Don't Breathe. But now it's a place of a director who I always want to like, he always pisses me off, Scott Derrickson, who did Doctor Strange, Sinister and The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Now, like, two of those films are great, but everything else is just being like, it could have been great, but he always just, something's missing. So to hear him do The Labyrinth 2 is like, oh, cool. Another film that doesn't need to exist. But then Netflix did quite well with um, Dark Crystal, the recent puppet uh, animation series from the film. So maybe this is the time for a Jim Henson, but then there's no Bowie. Yeah. Like if they do a CGI dead Bowie, no one wants that. No one needs that. <laughs> Another kind of questionable film we talked about a couple of weeks ago that Tom Cruise wants to go to space. Mm. Well, he has a director to take him to space. Oh, no. And it's a director that they were working on the idea together. It was Doug Lindman um, who did I have, uh, Edge of Tomorrow. Yeah. He's made quite a few films, Doug Lindman. And he's quite good friends with Tom Cruise, which is like, okay, that makes sense. The problem I've got with it is that Doug Lindman is very well known for being incredibly difficult on set and lots of problems on set where they have to like replace him or save it in the edit. Most of his films are saved in the edit. So to be like, you're the guy to come to space. Yeah. <laughs> I got problems with that. I feel like there's, there may be problems. He even has a film right now called Chaos Walking, which has um, Tom Holland and Daisy Wright Ridley stuck in limbo for the last three years because apparently it is just unwatchable oh. so he's now going to space so you know it's almost like they've hit a self-destruct button and gone oh who can we get in to direct this oh this guy who hasn't completed this last film that he was working on <laughs> he sounds like the right fit talking of um directors who get in a little bit of trouble scorsese's new film the killer of the flower moon which um again i, I don't know what's happening here but is a western set in the early 1910s, I believe I spoke about it before. Budget has hit like 240 million. Why? Probably, he's got DiCaprio and uh, De Niro in it, but still, it's ridiculous. And he was looking to possibly go to Netflix, but Apple have stepped in to finance the film with Paramount, which is Apple going, it's our time to shine. But it's, I'm saying like, well, Scott says, do you need all this money to make these films? <laughs> it made sense on the technology side for The Irishman, and Netflix have a lot of money, sure, but to now want it for every single film? I don't know. Lots of questionable things in this week. So, like I said at the beginning, guys, we wanted to sort of give you guys a little bit more of uh, an idea of who we are at Trash Arts. So we thought we'd make this episode more focused around us and give you a bit of insight into who we are. Um, so yeah, just wanted to start off. I'm going to interview Sam initially and then we're going to have a bit of a discussion around it. Um, so yeah, Sam, first question is what made you start Trash Arts? Well, I, I kind of wanted to be a filmmaker when I was about 11 years old. I used to write like stories all the time and it was only when watching more films and I think it was Lord of the Rings and The Mummy Returns when I was 11. but. Those films made me think of like, whoa, well, I want to see my stories played out through film rather than trying to write like book after book. And I, I wrote like a lot of horror. I wrote constantly horror films. I also wrote weird, not, not I wouldn't say erotica, but 
weird kind of like South Park Kenny James Bond stories that had a lot of sex in. I remember once my mum found all these stories. Oh my god. She was like, what is this about? I was like, it's just, you know, don't worry, it's not like I'm not going to do anything, it's just storytelling. And then, you know, I kept trying to make films and I made some terrible horror films when I was young. Because you notice it. You notice when there's a little four foot year old being running after an adult with a knife, it just doesn't look right. <laughs> I knew nothing about camera angles and I started casting for like, because I was writing non stop. And when I was casting for films, I was like 14, casting with actors who were in their like late 30s for a gangster film, which were really into it. And each time I'd be like, oh, what am I doing? I am way too young to be doing this, so I'd back away. Um, and that just kept happening until I went into college and did uh, film studies. And I met um, some guys who were like kind of mutually minded. And we started talking about, well, why don't we set up like a film company? And I, I kept thinking about trash arts, it was a twi twi choice between trash arts and freak films, which is what I was using when I was like 15. But yeah, freak films isn't great. <laughs> and then like, I don't know, like, I was just trying to picture what does trash arts physically look like. And I just kept thinking of like a Mona Lisa in, in like a trash can. And I thought, yeah, I want to be that. <laughs> I want to make stuff that has artistic intent, but might be a little bit trashy and pulpy around the edge, you know? No, that's cool. So was that then when you went on to make your first film? And what was the kind of pros and cons of making that film? Well, <clears throat> I spent most of my like youth trying to make films but never actually finishing one. And then all just being like continuous shooting or whatever. The first short film that led to doing the first feature was a short film called Tutulu. And Tutulu was, um, I think it was my film studies project. But it was sort of like a prelude because I knew I wanted to make a feature film when I was 18. It's what I wanted to do. And Tutaloo played with a lot of basically stealing from Donnie Darko, David Lynch, whatever I was watching at that time that I was being introduced to. I was just going, oh, I want to do a story like that and I'll make it really complex, which led me to writing Flummox. Flummox was my first feature film. Um, I, like, I originally wrote it when I was 15 with uh, my good friend Gemma Mitchell, but it was a very different script. And when I went back to it, I met a whole different crew of people. I was confident we can do this. It'll be out there, it doesn't matter because I'm clearly a genius and I'm gonna be so great, everything's gonna go perfect. And evidently, genius doesn't hit you that quickly when you've studied and done nothing and learned nothing from any experience on a film set. I fell out of a lot of people, I had, I brought on actors who were friends who weren't really actors, they were more on just being friends who just caused confrontation with the crew that brought in actors. Um, I got removed as director on the film. They removed me and just put me down as just cast and I had to sit and watch them direct the rest of the film and be like, this is horrible. But I was terrible. I didn't know what I was doing. But I think that's like so important because I know that everything I've ever done that set, I would never want to repeat on another set ever again. It's kind of almost like you have to have it go terrible, like go terribly wrong for then you to sort of have reflection in it afterwards. Yeah. And notice what you did wrong and what you can kind of improve on. Hmm. So then what was the, the next few years? Like, well, well, the next few years was um, jumping back on the old ego train, thinking I was brilliant. <laughs> using, you know, Gotta be, love be, the ego train. being 19, using filmmaking as a chat up line and just doing stupid stuff and trying to put the idea together for another film, slowly driving the people I was working with crazy where they just hated me. Um, but we shot another film called Love You Too. And Love You Too, I really liked the idea of it because I was trying to be more like, Michael Haneke and trying to be more like a European auteur and do something very dark and drama based. But again, having no emotional, you know, being 19, there is no emotional substance to be able to create something that like that. And I look back and I think, oh God, why did I do that? But again, it's all learning and it's all trying to understand. And I, and I knew that I'm always going to be coming back to these dark kind of things. Um, but at the same time, methadrone was around. I really liked taking drugs all the time. So I took drugs constantly, alienated everyone around me and found myself losing everything possible. Um, it was, yeah, it was a crazy time, but it's, it's what happens when you just, you're in that strange state where there's just one decision of, well, you gotta keep making films, and these people that you're working with, they wanna build a real career. And at that time, I wanted to build a career, but I also wanted to just escape as much as possible, because like 21 and life wasn't great. Um, but I wouldn't give up any of it because, again, it's all inspiration and it makes you learn and get stronger from moving forward after that. 
And then that's when me and you, Jack, kind of got involved. So you had the wasters. Yeah, so which was like, the wasters was your filming reflecting on that, that period and sort of... Yeah, so a lot of the characters were... For you. I know that a lot of the characters were based on people that you'd experienced. Well, this is it. The wasters was an opportunity to, um, yeah, like, write about that whole experience. And I tried to write originally when I was on the drugs. And I was on loads of different drugs. And I just wrote it too proactively positive. But I was thinking, oh, it's like on the road. It's like Jack Durak. It's like those classic things. It's like, no, this is not that exciting. You're just sitting, sniffing a load of crap. And it's just binge culture. It's a horrible culture. And I thought, well, that's more interesting of a film. So when I stopped taking all the drugs, I wanted to make that film. I just wanted to, um, if I remember the tagline was, it's not about the beginning, it's not about the end. It's about the moment. Yeah. And we wanted to try and do that with a nice, like, new kind of um, cast and crew because I'd only just started working with you guys. And actually, I think the first actor was uh, Rory Kennard, who played um, Dee Dee, the drug dealer. And then he introduced me to you, as in Ryan. And then Ryan introduced me to Jackson. And then everyone else started coming forward with it. And um, it was quite an ambitious shoot because I, I needed to prove that I could do filmmaking away from the people I was working with who had gone on to start their own kind of film companies. So I was working with this guy called Stan, and Stan was great. But I knew that we were going to be doing a lot of the jobs together. So, um, yeah, we would jump around different locations. We had to hire places and <clears throat> shoot at, like, ridiculous AM in a forts and stuff to create rave culture, <laughs> film in a nightclub. And it was really cool. And it's a grimy little film that's, like, I don't know, I appreciate it more when I go back to it. And I know that it gets quite a lot of, like, attention on some of the VOD sites. So it's still kind of works for a lot of people it's interesting because like at that time i think i was 20 when we first got in touch because mm. we shot i think we originally met when i was in my third year at uni and it was before christmas i can't really remember I thought it was the second year i'm pretty sure it was the second year because the third year would have gone into um the 2012 films oh yeah yeah oh, yeah yeah you're right so it was second year mm. um <clears throat> and yeah we were at uni together jackson yeah. And I remember whenever I met you and you offered me like the lead role um, of Average Joe, I was, what, 20 odd, 19 odd, like mm. absolutely ecstatic thinking, <laughs> yeah, I just bagged this role, I'm the bee's knees and stuff. But I remember when we actually started shooting it and stuff and the ambition, it kind of, it, it dawned on me a little bit more that, oh, okay, this is like something proper. I, I've never experienced this level of well, I suppose detail in terms of being on a film set, because you come up with an idea when you're at uni and you shoot a project, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily on the same scale where you're going to different venues and having to, you know, book out the rave, for mm -hmm. example. That was all new to me. But that was the cool thing with doing the, um, doing that film and then you guys coming on to be part of the company, because before, mm. it was me and some other people, but, but it was very much, I thought it was about me, because I was young and I was dumb. When you guys came on board, it was just this mindset that I was like, no, I just want to get in as many creative perspectives as possible so we can create together. Sure, it's not like it wasn't immediately like that. I made a lot of mistakes still. But um, that's why when we moved on from there and um, yeah, we started to look at you guys directing and making more films as a collective, trying to be seen as a collective yeah. and not just one person. We had a lot of collaborative meetings, didn't we? And we discussed loads of different projects and stuff at that time. And then that's where, you know, the, the year of 2012, and it mm. became very ambitious. Well, yeah, I think there was a, a lot of partying as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, every meeting would end with us going out. So. <laughs> so, well, it was either Monday Night Delight or um, was it Friday Night like Worcester? I think we went out every day. That's we it. did, we but out. they were the major ones. <laughs> the, um, yeah, the weird thing with 2012 is like, we made, well, we attempted to make four feature films. Yeah. That's what we set out to do. We had one no, direct... No, we, we aimed to make three. Drug tours came up. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. We aimed to make three. So the initial... Yeah. We ended up making three. Was it, it was One Road, Evil. Well, it was, well, it was Our Last Summer from yeah. David Burton Woods, yeah. which we shot in April. Um, and then there was going to be One Road, and then Evo, and then Drug Tours came along later on. Now, of course, One Road didn't work out as well as the other ones. Did. <laughs> well, that was our first film experience. Yeah. So me and, me and Jack were co-directing this, and again, I, I bring you back to the point that I think at this point we were, what, 20? You might have been 20, I was 21. Yeah, um, something like that. So, yeah, because it was 
2012, yeah. So we were very naive. And Incredibly I think, so. like, again, it goes back to the whole idea of being a bit in over your head. Like we had, um, if you remember, Fiona Ryan. And yes. she was quite a critically acclaimed up-and-coming actress at the time. She was in Love You Too as well. Yeah. Um, but we got her involved. And I know that for me personally, it was very much like, oh my God, we have a star. <laughs> <laughs> and we wrote the script and everything and put it together. And then unfortunately, like we, we didn't manage to finish all the filming. Well, and we I, lost. Think, I think it was like a lot of it that like when you when we tried to put it together at some point like a lot of it just couldn't work like it no. just felt like nothing was happening throughout the film and um, it's just really odd scenes there were scenes where like it was supposed to be at one person's house and we had to reshoot somewhere else or something oh like yeah that. there was all that odd little bits and pieces that they just didn't but I think even Didn't initially, from the get-go, when we sat down and comprised it, it was meant to be a sequel to The Wasters mm. that focused on Joe and his partner. Well, it wasn't supposed to be a sequel. We, we wanted it to be a prequel yeah, and like a sequel. The, oh, yeah, the yeah, Wasters yeah. was supposed to happen yes. in the middle yeah. of this <laughs> film. And, and that's madness. It that was a massive terrible. ambition. But then also, what kind of... Um, I remember is that we couldn't get Helen back involved. Oh, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. So we had to recast, like, mm. Joe's girlfriend's character. Mm. Well, this is the thing... What we've tried to consistently do within Trash Arts is to hopefully get other people making their own films so it's not just one filmmaker making it, it's a collective. Mm. Yeah. And it hasn't always worked. And in the beginning it didn't work a lot of times because like, before you guys have tried to get other people to try and make their feature film and it's because the way I work is very different to most people would want to work. So I get why like me going, right, well, if you do it like me then you'll make it. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't mean you're going to achieve it. No. It's only over time that the style within what we do at Trash Arts allowed it to, um, you know, we work, okay, you've got one location, we've got a few days, let's work for the limitations we have, be as creative as you want, blah, 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 blah. Those sort of things as opposed to going, right, you're going to make your first film, we're going to do what the film that you want to make. Yeah. It has to work within, you know, what... The boundaries of reality. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but I think, I think that's what, uh, like, attracted me to the way that, you know, you, you worked in as, as, you know, trash arts and, and sort of the other people around it was that it, it, it felt like um, when I've been growing up and, and putting on uh, plays and things like that, preparing for theatre festivals and stuff, um, we would often, like, within two weeks, we would throw a show together, like, put on, a, put on quite a sort of intelligent play or something like that. It, it, it would always do quite well at these festivals. And it was just like, it, it was the same kind of way that you worked to bring in that intelligence, bringing that, um, you know, trying to take a bit more of a deeper look into things, but getting it done and doing it in like a, a, a you know, a rough round the edges kind of way so that it could be done. Um, and that's what, yeah, attracted me to this in, in the first place. Yeah, I, I think as well, like, even though we had probably bad experience with the way that one road turned out and it, mm. it obviously never made it to the light of day. Um, but I think thereafter we started honing in on different skills that, you know, if you think about Evil, for example, I, I know I wasn't meant to be involved. That was, that was my first producer credit, I think. Yeah. Um, so we would sit with the actors and we would like talk through what kind of scenes we wanted and stuff. And mm. Jackson, you were obviously cast in that. Um, and then two weeks before shoot, and we'd diarise the dates and everything. We had a, a set location that we'd booked through um, the guy who owned the house, and <clears throat> which I think you, Jackson, were living in at the time. No, so. I, I moved into office. Oh, right. It was yeah. Very, very strange <laughs> with a film that we shot. Yeah. There. It was horrible, actually. But then two weeks before shoot, one of the lead actors dropped out, and because I had um, spent so much time during uh, rehearsals and stuff, honing in and perfecting the characters. Sam That's it. asked me to jump in. You learn, uh, you, 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 you got to learn very early that you're not always going to have exactly what you thought was going to be. It could be a, literally a day or a week, but there may be a cast changing. And in fact, like in most of our feature films, we've had at least one actor have a major like change at the last minute. Yeah. And as well, like with Evol, I think that was probably one of our mo most ambitious projects at the time. And out of the projects that came out my personal opinion of 2012 um, or that we filmed in 2012 that's one that still holds its own a lot more and still gets a lot of hits yeah it still gets a lot of attention and it's kind of nice because it was something that I was like because I was reading a lot of Brett, Brett Easton Ellis at the time and I was reading and I was watching performance and I just really wanted to do something a bit more you know that kind of 
pushed it where sexual boundaries didn't have to be about, oh my God, I'm gay and it's a big deal. It's like, no, they all just fuck whoever they want. It's more about the manipulation that's going on underneath than just about, you know, sexuality being the main element. Mm. And then of course, uh, I think what I would describe as our most ambitious project, oh, even though it I know was you're out of the say. blue, was the drug tours. Um, you know, we, uh, you, you came up with that idea after going to pick up yeah, some Yeah, I went to pick up some weed. Um, <laughs> and Marijuana. I was chatting to my dealer and he was like talking about just different drug dealers. He was just gossiping about them. <laughs> and I was just listening to him and I was like, oh, you could do a really cool mockumentary, just meet different drug dealers and then they all sort of know each other. And, and I was just like, that's a great idea. After you have a bit of a smoke with your dealer, you go back home. And I was just like, guys, I've got an idea. And then we just built it up and we got more people involved. And it was just like, how far can we push that continuous shot within improvisation by working with a mockumentary? And I used to do shit like that back in college where we just run around pretending that we were hosting something, but it wasn't designed for anything. It was just to see how far we could go into keeping the performance and kind of what reaction you get from other people. Mm. And um, Drug Tours was like, we needed to have more of a set design than just obviously going around annoying people. <laughs> but yeah. there had to be that dedication to know that if the real world interacts with you, you're on drugs. You react <laughs> like you're on drugs. Uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a crazy, crazy experience for having to shoot a film where essentially I played the first dealer, you guys got there, and I'd go to each house whilst you guys continued filming. Mm. And from a story that, again, was only a couple of weeks written, mm. um, we didn't have an opportunity for re uh, rehearsal. We met at the actors a few times, but everyone just ran with it because as soon as you're told, just stay in character. Yeah. The mockumentary is part of it. You can look wherever you want, be annoyed by the film crew there. People have a bit more flexibility. Yeah. That's the thing, I think, where it was an experience where you could just go with it and, like, you know, just stay in character. It was it was a lot of fun, but, God, that was that was a stressful sort of prep that we yeah, had to do. Yeah, yeah. Like, I remember. And I, I screwed up the, uh, I gave you, made you take ecstasy. And it yeah. wasn't in the script at all. Like, not for real, obviously, yeah, yeah. but, you know, in the, in the story. I remember... Um, that I, I had a little uh, Ford Fiesta and I'd just finished work. And I went, well, I think I finished about eight o'clock. So then I came straight to the shoot and then we just rolled straight into filming. And just to put it into perspective for anyone who doesn't know about the drug tours, we shot it in one night over the course of what, two hours? Yeah. And continuously through two separate cameras. So one camera would follow Jackson's character, one camera would follow my character. Um, and then it's intercut like um, throughout the film, so yeah. you get to see everyone's perspective and as, as is real time during the film. And like, so for the first, like a lot of that film, we, me and you didn't interact at all, really. We Not really. Just, we just... Only like when we were doing the interviews. Yeah, yeah, when I was basically bullshitting you the whole time, yeah. that's what I felt like. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, and I ended up having that trigger word, you know, you know, mm. um, which was funny. Um, so yeah, basically just Sam, and Jack, and I suppose myself, to give you guys an idea. Um, so what then happened the years after 2012? Because there was a few more different projects. Well, after 2012, <clears throat> we, sort of, um, we sort of went back into doing more short films. We made a film yeah. called, um, well, first tried to make a film called Two-Face, which never got completed because it was a little bit too ambitious. And we, we had a lot of people coming from different places and it just didn't fit. And the things we did film, <clears throat> we're like in the middle of summer and it was boiling and it just fell apart but afterwards we made promises which was one of those again it seems to work for us when something doesn't work we go oh, fuck it let's just do one more in our control simpler it turns out to be some of our better work mm -hmm. and promises got us into a lot of film festivals and it was after that that we um we started working on the next feature film the animals and the animals was um i don't know it was it was desire not to do something that was like either drugs or sex obsession or anything like that. It was to tell a crime story that had a sense of morality to it. Um, and I wanted to work with particular actors who'd been in the, the other films, so like Ben James Archer had been in The Wasters, Ross Allen Boney had been in The Wasters and The Drug Tours. So it was Ben, actually. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then we got Rishi Gosh involved and we got Jackson Davies and we're bringing in new people. First one we did with Suki Jones. 
I think that's well, when it started. First, to... This was the first film that I, I um, DIP'd. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so it was there was more of a cre- not not a creative vision for making the film, but it had more of a direct. You know, you were the cinematographer, I was the director, I was the writer. It was more. Yeah. It wasn't as mad we dash learned, as the other ones. Yeah, we, we learned, learned so not to more. not to tread on each other's toes and yeah. have people in charge of certain jobs because that way you make sure that job gets done. Yeah, um, the the unfortunate thing is it took three years to make yeah. because there were life things that were getting in the way. There was a very fact that our laptop crashed and we lost half the edit. Oh yeah. God, six months worth yeah. of editing just done. <laughs> and we started. Is that when we lost one road? To be fair, it, no, that was. That was um, after. Oh yeah, god, it happened that. twice. We, we, yeah. That happened with the uh, animals. We didn't lose the footage, we just lost the edit yeah. of what we'd done. Um, but um, Sam took it from there because I couldn't, I couldn't touch it anymore and it turned out a much better cut. So, you know. We also, like, we, it took us more chance to move the story around and recraft it a little bit. And that's something that we kind of bring on to a lot of feature films now where we go, okay, maybe we can shoot a little bit more or maybe actually the scene works better there. And I think the, the animals definitely gave that opportunity. But in between the animals, um, I, I, I don't know, I felt kind of lucky. I got to like sneak off with uh, Tom and the actress Tamsin Hausland and make industrial animals, which was our first kind of step into like, you know, extreme films, essentially. With um, Evo, it could have been extreme, but it's not really. You know, no, it doesn't have no, any... Sorry, like... It's not just about nudity, yeah. it's about like that sexual content. Mm. It's more about just the kind of hunger for the, the, the sex they want between them. It's, it goes straight into a very casual relationship immediately. Mm-hmm. Whereas something like Industrial Animals is about the seediness and the power dynamic within um, prostitution, essentially, but with a bit of a horror twist on it. And that was great. I loved filming that simply because it was like just going, right, let's just go with it. And we had the location. It was just the three of us. It was a pretty strange and weird shoot. But um, I think when you're making those sort of films, they're going to be weird. There's no way around it. Mm. Um, and we were quite lucky with that film because it got the attention towards um, uh, getting Troma involved and having Lloyd Kaufman like, and it's, and it's his guys representing the film. And I, I just want to say a lot of that is down to working with uh, Tony Newton, who actually had like a massive impact on how we sort of saw the company from about 2015 onwards. We started making more horror shorts. And we started to put more of a focus on doing horror films. We already had the love for horror and we were always trying to write stuff. But by doing these shorts and putting them in Tony's anthologies and then producing films with Tony afterwards, it kind of like really helped to um, get us a bit more of an audience out there. Exposure. Yeah. And, yeah. To, and to get sort of like the, the names sort of known in a bit of a different way and, and yeah, yeah. thought about differently. And that's it. And that's um, definitely what Industrial Animals got to do for us. And it started getting our better reviews as well. And... For a film that effectively costs nothing, because up to this point everything was costing nothing, but this film costs like zero, you know. When was it that we shot the um, the original making of uh, Colchester? Well, the footsteps was twenty fifteen. <coughs> that was the end of twenty fourteen. Oh, was the end of twenty fourteen? Yep. <coughs> yeah, because uh, that was. I mean, we shot uh, the original um, short film for a, a sixty hour film challenge, and it was just we just thought like let's make a mockumentary about a film crew trying to do a 60 hour film challenge um and i mean i thought you know it it, it I, we sort of thought it's a bit of a gimmick but let's let's see if it if it works kind of thing um and it just really came together with the, you know the dynamic of everyone um and then like a year later we decided to turn that into a web series um, i think yeah at the beginning of 2016 yeah yeah for me at this point obviously i got life things going on had a mm. son so like I I'd kind of taken a bit of a back seat. So footsteps was one of the first things I'd done since I think it was drug tours. Yeah. Um, and then thereafter I was just kind of in the making of. Um, it's a funny thing with the making of because it was us stepping into I, I guess it's watching more TV and getting more influences, and we decided to do the web series the making of and basically very closely to the kind of things that we're used to seeing in making indie films, but just having a bit of a laugh with it and almost having a bit more heart with the yeah. characters and yeah letting, letting the actors kind of go in the directions they want to go with characters like 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 Chris Mills' character Paul Renoir he was only supposed to be in like one episode <laughs> and he slowly got into more episodes and it was just that it love of the character it became yeah. Cast, yeah. 
And I think that's one of the lovely things in the making of us. It always had this sense of um, a friendly kind of family sort of thing. It's very communal and, and we all got very close towards it. And we're still shooting it. Yeah. We've still got hopefully season five coming out next year. So yeah, it was, it was in between the short times, starting to get into that mindset of going, okay, Let's keep on creating. Let's create as much as we can. But that's what I was just going to say is that the, I suppose at this point that's where it was a case of right. Let's get involved in as many mm. things as we can do. Mm. You'd gotten more experience, and um, we had a wealth of kind of actors and um, a portfolio of people that we could have potentially go and cast yeah. for that project. Sam would be in charge of that project. Jack, you would be in charge of another project, and it kind of just started to work, yeah. and then it became like a never-ending reoccurring thing yeah in terms of films i mean i think like last year for example uh, i mean i know we're we're flipping forward a bit here um but um you ended up directing your first feature film yeah i ended up directing my first feature film and you directed a feature film as well didn't yeah, you? yeah. Sam, we yeah. did decline yeah. yeah so sam sam the decline i, I uh, made monstrous and you made unwanted um, and it's sort of like that was the that 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 was twenty twelve how twenty twelve was going to go yeah. in our heads yeah, and actually yeah. now we've got all of that experience it took a long time but we all What's managed the thing? to do it for me like twenty seventeen is when we because because like I said things kept expanding we were getting more crew involved when we had Emma Jane Lloyd join doing sound mm. we were meeting new directors with Jessica Hunt and Martina Madej and uh, so many more different people were getting involved. And that's when we did um, Toxic Schlock, which was obviously co-director with Tony Newton. So it was, again, bringing in other creative voices. That's when we met um, Hill Burton and Martin W. Payne, which then led into the film that really kind of, to me, was exactly where I wanted to be doing with Trash Arts. It sounds kind of seedy when you think what the film is, but, <laughs> but uh, Lonely Hearts. And I got to co-director with Jess, and it was having that complete equality and understanding with her as to how this film needs to work, mm -hmm. and both having the right love and attention to the points of what we needed um, and it was after that that it felt like, okay, I can co-direct with people and I think as a company we can start getting other people in for directing because there's a lot more safety here. There's a lot of crew and cast who know our sort of style and how we work. There's a freedom to be able to do the ideas you want and for us to be able to try and, you know, get them as best as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I think after that when we just started, by, cause, yeah, I can't remember how many features that was, I think. I think that was another three features that year because you had Fixer, which was on yeah, going. Course, yeah. And again, with Fixer, we got the opportunity to work with Portsmouth Legends, with uh, Michael J. Murphy, with MJM International. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it was starting to see that circle because then after that, you're starting to get your films a bit more out there. And oddly, when we stuck to being more genre-focused filmmakers instead of doing dark dramas and doing horrors and stuff like that, that's when we really sought a community around us on a bigger sense, mm -hmm. nationally and internationally and talking to so many different filmmakers across the world to become good friends. And you would see them growing, and you are seeing yourself growing, and you are seeing the same articles where you're both being discussed and stuff. It's, it's kind of crazy, it's cool. And 2017 was really that opportunity when we started working with other film companies who really were pushing us forwards, and we were helping to push them forwards. That's when things started to yeah. go right. I think, I think each, of, each of the learning processes other than those of the, the technological kind um, have been about how to collaborate yeah. properly, how to work and get the best out of um, each other and uh, that's yeah. why you hire people you, you well, not so much hire but you want to get the people involved who are enthusiastic mm. and have the craft so you can showcase what they want to give it yeah you know and that can only work with a sense of equality to understand that like we we're all here for these reasons mm. we're all going to help each other and make it work yeah I think that's one of the things I experienced when I came back um, like on a full-time basis was the opportunity to write my own stuff. Like we, Me and you, Sam, collaborated quite yeah, a lot yeah. with Decline and came up with a story for that. Um, and then thereafter, we collaborated in writing The Unwanted, which then I was directing, and that was a completely new experience for me. I know that you had quite an experience doing Monstrous, Jackson. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it's kind of... It almost went full circle in a way, like you were mm -hmm. saying, and that everything that we did want to do in twenty twelve ended up happening in twenty nineteen. Yeah. The circles of collaborators just got bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's so many people you want to like go. They're great. Like obviously, I love. Don't, I won't name every single person who's helped us, but there's been so many people who've just pushed it forwards and appreciate the kind of way we do things, and you appreciate the way they do things creatively, and you just see a mutual understanding. 
You're yeah. always trying to help each other. Yeah. You, like scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, kind of thing. And watching watching other people's films at that are, are, are a similar sort of, similar sort of level to us, mm. I always find that I've learned something new about what what you can do and sort yeah, of how yeah. you can push uh, you know some kind of effect or or make something work in the mind more so than actually seeing it on the screen. Like um, that's. Yeah, I think I think. I think it hones in on your writing as well, mm. because it gives you a different perspective. If you it shared an experience with someone else who's written something in a certain way, and then you learn from them, it's like, oh, okay, this newfound idea of how do I put what I've got in my head onto, you know, the big screen, and um, yeah. but add something new to it, add something fresh. Mm. I suppose the last thing for me really is, just want to give the guys out there. An overview of where we're at right now and what's been going on. Well, recently with Trash Arts, we've um, we've got quite a few releases out. So we have uh, Millennial Killer, which has been released by Dark Side Releasing, which is now on their bot site. Yep. Along with Carney Films, Day of the Stranger, always give them a plug. Um, <clears throat> as as well as Lonely Hearts being on the same distributor. And at the moment, we're just trying to work with as many different things to get our work out there. I think um, we have higher ambitions for bigger films, but at the same time we want to create mm. and with the situation that's happening right now all we want to do is try and create in the, in the best way possible there's no point holding on to like no we have to do it this way it's not how we've ever worked yeah. mm. it's about creation and it's about making something that we're kind of proud of mm. um, it's about working within the limitations of your reality and that's something that we had to learn the hard way along the, along yeah. the years of, yeah. you know, what can we feasibly do and uh, if we have an idea of something that we want to do outside of that, then we need to know how to, we're going to do it. And that's the thing. I think these challenges, they're only going to become harder because that's how it's designed. Mm -hmm. It's not designed to get easier as you're trying to go up like any sort of like career, you know. Um, and we, we do have some ambitions to shoot some stuff over the summer to, to shoot within the, the new regulations that we have right now. Um, taking a new approach to trying to get the interest for the film. Can't talk, we'll probably talk about that more next week in the discussion with everyone about COVID. But yeah. Yeah. As well as um, we've got our other films. So the thing is, we, we produce so much that there are so many different films at different points. So it's we know. We're just going to say this. Yeah, we, we know we've got a lot of releases for at least the next three years, covered with anthologies, uh, narrative films from different directors. I just hope that they get the audience interest really and to get some sort of response and I hope that they I hope the filmmakers get to have the response that we've had in our previous films by getting to go to film festivals after all of this to be able to see from a direct audience what it feels like mm. fortunately as we experienced recently with the um, Without Your Heads watch party for Truth All Out there's still that that still works having a watch party of still getting that audience response and seeing the love they have in it because they're like commenting like crazy as, as the film's going on so I feel like all we're going to try and keep doing is getting as much films out there and try and still create those opportunities but within whatever societal boundaries we're expected to, to be part of yeah. as mm -hmm. things go on. And as I said before, you know, trash arts like cockroach. You know, <laughs> we can go through recessions, we can go through dodgy governments, we can go through personal shit. But it's still going to crawl up and carry yeah. on making disturbing you just, little pieces you of You just art. can't kill us because we will we'll make films for, with absolutely nothing. Yeah. Like, we don't even need a camera to make a film. No, we do. We do. <laughs> there are film. some values. Right? That would be a bit weird. But even, like you say in that, if we didn't have a camera, you've got phones. Yeah. So yeah. you utilise that. This don't is you? it. We've, for, Trash Arts has been around for 13 years and we have constantly just tried to create and support others and to try and build like more of a community artistically around us. It's, I've, I've always said this sort of thing, but there's no like, um, there's no I in just scene, you know? A scene is not built around one person, it's built around a collective of people. And the more like, I'm sort of seeing that as though it doesn't have to be literally your local circle. Mm. It could just be the community you're working in. So if you've got yeah. a bunch of indie horror filmmakers making really great stuff at the same time, they're all part of the same scene. And they're, yeah. they're, and they're usually, and this is what's beautiful about this scene, supports each other yeah. and promotes e each other. Mm -hmm. And that's all we try to do with Trash Arts is to promote different creators and to create whatever the fuck we want. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, we've not really talked about events in this, but um, I think that the way that we've done events has been very beneficial into, uh, you know, participating in films as well because we've often been working with musicians, with writers, with mm. poets, with all those kind of things. Um, 
and yeah, so I, I think there's a uh, you know that that that's part of the collaboration, that's part of the building of a of a wider scope of people in your local area at the same time as these sort of yeah, no, uh, national and international connections. Yeah, which we also do with getting involved with our own film festivals, with Making Waves Film Festival mm. and the Real Indie Film Festival. It is a chance to, to showcase local talent as well as being like, hey, look, there's a whole world of film around here. You'll be able to see those films as well as support the films that are real close to you here. Yeah. So I feel like um, we're only going to keep trying to do that and there's just different platforms and different ways to learn how to do that, you know? Yeah, agreed. So thank you for listening, guys. Hope you enjoyed the podcast today. So we're actually doing a watch party on June the 11th where we'll be showcasing the animals. Um, so yeah, I, th I believe that's at 8 o'clock. Please give it a check out. And um, as ever, if you like the content, give us a like, leave a comment, and uh, give us a share. And also, subscribe. Other than that, Trash Arts Take out. Bye. -bye.